to have Jezri Friend come and minister the word. Won't you give him a round of applause as he comes? Hey, we're so excited. Oh, good morning, everyone. I say it really is something special, right? When the Spirit of God is here, it's just, it's, you can feel it. You almost, you don't want to move. And so I almost feel disrespectful even doing this now because it just, it was so heavy today. And uh, I think there's something amazing as Christians, right, that we could do is something that I try and pray with my kids and that we pray, I pray as often as I think it when I need it, right, is that a couple things. One, that your hand would go before us and be with us, but that your spirit would be with us whenever we're doing. So I encourage you all, like, whatever you're doing this week, your job, work, having an uncomfortable conversation, doing something you don't want to do, whatever it is, before you do it's like, Lord, let your spirit be with me. Let your spirit be in that situation, in that place. And if it's, it may not go the way you want still, but at least you have some level of peace, and I feel it when I do. Um, you know, as I always wanted to, I know I didn't go to the Bible school, but the thing that they, everyone always said that there was the big thing that Pastor or Apostle Joe Crandall said was that the best thing, the most important thing for a Christian to do is to hear God to hear God, and I would like to add to that is like to have, feel God's spirit, feel his presence, because I hope you took advantage of this time, however short it was to enter in, and what Pastor Matt was just ending on, on, on the talents kind of actually goes into, we're going to touch on some of the talents today, and our talents, so I'm going to pray real quick, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get into it, so Lord, thank you for this morning, thank you for your presence, thank you for meeting us, thank you for being here in this church in Fairview, Pennsylvania, Lord, touch our hearts, <clears throat> open our minds, put down our defenses that we would receive, that we would hear you, Jesus, that we would get something out of the time we're giving today, that it wouldn't just be here to come, but we would be here to receive something and take this and then not just hear it, but be doers of the world, word, like James says. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're going to go over a couple things today. I'm gonna talk, today's conversation is going to be about really spiritual matur- maturity. Spiritual maturity. So look to somebody and say, grow up. (laughs) Oh, we weren't expecting that. (laughs) Grow up. Also, by the way, disclaimer, Tony gave me permission to call him out if he's not fully paying attention. He asked me, he's like, am I going to get scared or jump? I was like, well, it's not too jumpy of a message, but if I see you dozing off, I'm going to call you out. (laughs) I'm just playing. Thanks, Tony. We're going to go over the topic is asset versus liability. What are you? What are you, an asset or a liability? We're going to talk about spiritual maturity. We're going to talk about how God can use us as an asset and how he's going to use what you already have, not what you think you want or what you think you need, but what he has already given you. You already have it, guys. We already have the things. We're already equipped with everything that God has for us to do. We just need to turn that into an asset and not allow those gifts to be a liability. We're going to talk about where that's in the scripture, and then we're going to end it on a challenge. And something that God pointed out to me in scriptures uh, recently, it's, I, I took it from another message I heard this last part, but it just jumped out at me. I'm like, wow, I never heard it that way. And it ends in Exodus. So that's going to be the last part. This today also came from, um, so you're going to see a little bit of tie into the business world, if you will. Uh, it, I, I've been doing some more, we'll call it personal growth, nothing related to my spiritual walk, just trying to grow as a person, how do I make more money, right? We're trying to learn other things, trying to figure out more investing things, and just trying to grow my knowledge and education. I tell you, the one thing you can never stop doing is learning. I challenge you, learn something new. Even if it's something you don't like, learn a thing in music, read the Wall Street Journal once in a while, do something that you wouldn't ordinarily do, and you'll be surprised how much that might help you in whatever it is you're your, th- your, uh, you know, your lane might be, your job, your focus, your likes, your interests. It makes you very much more well-rounded when you do things that's not like the same things everybody else in your lane is doing. So with that, I've been learning all this good world knowledge, head knowledge, and God spoke to me on asset and liability, and we're talking about the differences, and then God said, what are you? And it kind of gave me a said to share this this week, so what is it? I'm probably you're going to hear me repeat some of these definitions in different versions because I kind of had different notes as I went through. Can God trust you? Do you something an asset is? This is kind of interesting. We'll go to the natural, then we'll hit the spiritual, right? 
uh, I think it's interesting, this misnomer amongst not everybody, but some people, when you buy a home, what does everyone say? Oh, it's the best maybe investment you'll ever make. If you think about it, it's really not. It's actually a liability. Because <laughs> what do we do with our homes? We're paying into it every month if we have a mortgage, right? Oh, the roof went bad. We've got to fix the roof. Or, or maybe we do upgrades and we want to add an addition or make it nicer or more beautiful or fix the facade or change the bathroom or put new cabinets in, right? It costs us money. It costs us money. Now, it might provide us some sort of value, I don't know, intrinsically or we, we aesthetically, but it doesn't really provide any return financially unless we're repurposing it for a bed and breakfast or something like that, right? An asset is something that returns value. An asset is something that you have and that the owner can rely on it to produce more of itself so that it can be used for other things. So, I'll catch up to my notes here a little bit, but what do you have that you can use? What do you have that you can use to produce? Now we're talking spiritually here. What do you have that God has given you that maybe has made you a liability? Is your role in the church an asset? Are you an asset to your brothers and sisters in Christ? Have you been a Christian for more than a couple years, but you still require to be waited on on a lot of things and you refuse to grow? There comes a time, I know this is a little bit of a hard part, but it does get a little more light, but there does come a time of spiritual maturity where we have to say, okay, I'm no longer be a liability to myself, to God who's trusting us, to our church, to the teams we serve on, but I'm going to be an asset and go and take a step further and produce and not have to always have to, well, I'll just say this, you know, I just deal with this with some of my, hopefully no one from work's watching this, but people at work where they just, their hand needs to be held sometimes. And it comes to a point like, you're an adult. Like, I'll use my army example. When I was in the army, right, and I was pretty young as uh, an E5, Nick, right? And so I had six people under me. I only had, and at like 20 years old, I had one person younger than me. Everyone else was older than I was of my six, six soldiers that were underneath me. And it was crazy to me how these people were older. Some of them had children. I didn't have children yet. And just like would complain and wouldn't do their job. And like they'll say, I'm like, you're an adult. <laughs> Grow up. These are the things we have to do. No one made you come here. You're getting paid money to do these things. Do it. We all get to go home at the end. It's okay. And so these people, they were liabilities. I had to, hey, did you bring your stuff? Oh, you forgot your stuff, even though we checked it before we left and you still didn't bring it. Like, and I'm like, then as I had kids, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the same conversation I had with a grown adult. Like, this is insane. So, and then God's saying to us sometimes is, can I rely on you to know this is what I told you to do? Just do it. Or does God have to keep coming? Does pastor have to keep coming? <sighs> You're still... Now, there's grace, and there's stuff we have to work through. Don't get me wrong. Please don't get offended by that. But there comes a point of personal responsibility where we have to take a step and say, no, no, no. I'm going to be responsible for me, and I'm going to be an asset so that frees up leadership to do other things, right, so that we're not being the crutch pulling down constantly. All right, I digress. We're going to move on. Being an asset is obviously, instead of a liability, is an important principle for our Christians specifically to live by. It's one of those things that sets us apart from regular folks, right? God has called us to so much more. We're, we're more accountable to not just our spiritual lives, but how we're perceived. We're going to look at how we can be an asset to God, our church, and our community. First verse I want to look at is 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. These are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but in the same God, who works all in all, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Amen. We've each been given a piece, guys, to profit this body. Let's just start here first, right? To profit all. You see, an asset is trusted by its owner to go produce on its own, to be poured into, to be invested in, so that it can go then pour into others. A liability takes. An asset, if run the right way and is fully uh, empowered, creates more assets. So here's kind of, I might be jumping ahead of my note, but a thought I learned, right? Uh, I have a couple of these like kind of business mentors that I, be, I meet with periodically that's just been helping me grow and learn some of these things that I honestly didn't know about. I didn't go to finance school, not my background. You guys know I have a thing in like policy. That's, I'm a big policy nerd. That's my thing. 
So I don't know anything about finance. I know very little about business. So I've been learning so much, though. And one of the things he was telling me about was, you know, having an asset mindset versus a liability mindset thinking. A liability does this. Let's say, because this is me. This is 100% me. I, I literally just did this recently. Uh, let's say you got a bonus at work or maybe sold an item or something. You have a couple extra dollars you didn't usually have. Or maybe you got a raise, right? Maybe it's $500, 1000 maybe a lot more than that. A liability mindset usually, because I do this, what can I buy with this? Yeah. Yeah. I buy a new camper. Uh, maybe I'm going on that vacation, <laughs> which we did. Uh, <laughs> so that was the wrong thing, but I stand by it. It's been crazy. Uh, you know, wh so a liability mindset takes it, and they kind of spoil that, that thing. An asset mindset says, how can I take this $1,000 and make $1,500 out of it? An asset mindset, how can I take this gift that God has given me and help create the gift that he has in you with it? How can I take this thing, and that's not all finances, guys. Yeah, this is just a worldly example, right? I mean, that could be an option, but there's a lot of options, right? How can we use the things that he's given me and create better things out of it in somebody else? See, that's what a leader does. A leader doesn't wait. A leader takes ownership. I used that example already. You invest. And so uh, this is kind of an interesting thought I thought of is, you know, you're making an investment in yourself every time you've taken the time. You got up, you brushed your teeth, you combed your hair, hopefully you showered, you came to church, right? And this is a time to in, that's investing right here. The church, you're investing in yourself, and God is investing in you. When we have a praise and worship service like that, and the spirit of God is in here, and he's putting something in us, and he's saying, here, I'm putting something in here. What are we going to do with it? That's a great thing. Getting a big bonus is a great thing. Do we just keep it to ourselves? And I'm not saying you have to give it to someone else, but can you use that spirit of God, right, that we had this morning? This is a real-world, timely, applicable example to pour out into others this week, to use that and say, wow, God really touched me. Or I heard from him. Can we use that to pray for somebody else? Can, you know, and not doing it and looking at me, but just using God's spirit. The church is making an investment every time that we're together, you and I. How do we return to that? Here's an interesting real world spiritual but earthly example. The church is invested in you in our Right Now Media. See that little plug I just popped in there? He didn't even tell me to do that. That Right Now Media app, right? How, I'm not going to, I'll do this. How many of you, right, are using that, right? It's pretty cool. I, I, I'm using it as much as I should be, but I have been checking it out uh, every other so often. And, but the Right Now Media app, if you guys aren't using that, that's to remind you, the church paid for that for everyone here to use it for free. We have a ton of subscriptions. Use them. If you don't know how to get them, talk to Jordan, I guess. I don't know. Sorry, Jordan. Put you on the spot. Maybe Esther, Levi, someone who knows how to download that. Great. But we probably got an email. If you didn't get an email, I'm sure we can go give you an email to set it up. The Right Now Media, guys, it's really cool. There is anything you want to know about your walk with faith. I'm having trouble with X. It's there. There's already a study guide for it. There's people. It's digestible. It's short. Uh, there's longer ones. There's shorter ones. Pastors from all over the world in there. Books, access, things that you would have to buy. It's just asking you to take a little bit of step and be accountable, be an asset, and invest in yourself. The church already met us halfway and gave us this, this opportunity, this, this, this thing to use. All right. So anyway, right now, media. I think, can you get it on the website? Is there a link on there? There we go. Another plug. Our new website. And uh, mbchurchfairview.org, mbchurchfairview.org, brand new website, guys. You haven't checked it out. Check it out. You can actually go and download your Right Now Media there, and you don't have to bother Jordan. Saved you, buddy. <laughs> Assets provide also future value. It's a long-term benefit to its owner. It's valuable and provides value. Assets pay for themselves. So when you have an asset thinking, this is interesting, right? That's what this guy was telling me. People have an asset mindset. So what we do is make a little bit of money, go use it, buy the boat, buy something else, bigger house, whatever. People have an asset mindset. They use that to buy more assets and let the assets buy those toys, et cetera, those extra things that's not necessary, luxury items, right? Whereas we want to buy those luxury items first with all the while keeping us at that lower level. But if you allow yourself to be an asset, right, and let assets build assets, the return comes later. That's biblical, guys. A liability is poured into, and it just needs constant upkeep. It often breaks down, and it doesn't produce. So then I ask, what is our fruit? What fruit are we producing? If you're not producing fruit, we need to have a hard check. Say, Lord, I give it all to you. I might need to become an asset. Colossians, our next verse, 3 
Colossians 3, 23 through 24. There it is. The Bible says, And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. So it's not amongst ourselves. All right. A little lighter. JFK quote. I just thought of this and I thought it was funny. Here it goes. Full circle. I like my policy stuff. You guys remember that whole, uh, what was JFK's, one of his famous, you know, don't ask what your country can do for you, but what you can do. So I kind of just kind of plugged around. Don't ask God, right, what he can do for you. But we should be asking, what can we do for him? What can we do for the church? Did we have some gaps here at this church that we need filled? I recently talked to somebody who said, oh, I want to do X, Y, Z. He's like, that's great. Don't wait. You know, every Sunday, you know, every other Sunday or so, Pastor Matt's like, hey, we need people to help with this and this. And then someone goes, oh, I wish someone would ask me to do that. We did. <laughs> we did. <laughs> but if the, you know, so meet us halfway. Don't have to have, a, this is when I talk about spiritual maturity. We have to grow up a little bit, take a little ownership. Hey, you know what? Maybe if you keep thinking about, guys, that's not your conscience. That's the spirit. Saying, hey, maybe you should step up a little bit. We need you. We can't do this without you. The church is not us. The church is Holly and Michelle and Megan. Every, it's every one of us. Without every one of us, it doesn't happen. We all must be assets pouring into each other and not liabilities taking from each other. All right. Here's my first story. Guys, this is my favorite part of this. And then we're going to go back to this at the end. Exodus 4, 1 through 4. We're going to read this. I didn't ask. What version did you pop that up? Just out of curiosity, yes. Okay, cool. Uh, then Moses answered and said, but suppose, so this happens, all right, you know what, just for the sake of it, guys, I'm sorry, I want to pull it up on my app, so that's how it's in my head. Give me a second. There we go. So this is uh, Exodus chapter 4. This is Moses um, speaking with God, and God's telling him, hey, you've got to go back to Egypt. This is what's up. You need to go free the people, all this stuff, right? And verse 1, we're going to go down to 4. Then Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me. Well, listen to my voice. Suppose they say, The Lord's not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, What's that in your hand? He said, A rod, sometimes a staff in other versions. And he said, Cast it to the ground. So he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. I mean, that's crazy, right? snake just appears. And then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it. And it became a rod in his hand. I'm going to stop right there. There's a lot to pack into this. I know you did a whole ver uh, thing on what's in your hand. And that's, I'm going to kind of repeat some of that here today. What's in your hand? Here's interesting. Let's dive through this. Verse number two, if you could pop that back up. Exodus 4, 2. And the Lord said, what's in your hand? Don't you think he knew what was in his hand? <laughs> He's God. That's something interesting to look out. Uh, look, you know, the, the first time that, you know, first mentioned, I'm going to repeat that, that God asked a question was in the garden with Adam and Eve. What's in your hand? When God asks a question, pay attention. He knows the answer. He's trying to teach you something. If he's asking, what did you do with what I gave you? What are you doing with that gift that you have? What are you doing with that prosperity I gave you? He knows. He knows what you're doing with it. He's saying, I want you to use it for me. I'm saying it because I'm saying that didn't come from me. Else. He's telling you, when you hear that question and that spiritual, you know, chimes going off that that's God speaking to you, he's saying it because he wants you to pay attention to it. He's saying, I want you to use that for me. When we're not doing that and we ignore that voice, we've become a liability to God. He can give things to us and we aren't producing It was just a staff. What's a staff good for? Just a rod. How very ordinary thing to use. My goodness, how many times have God used so very ordinary things in people constantly? We think we have to be the most special whatever or have some degree or be born or make a certain amount of money or drive a car. He was a shepherd. Now, he wasn't initially a shepherd, but it was interesting because <clears throat> I thought about this. <clears throat> when he had that staff, who, who carried staffs? Shepherds. It was an identifier. It showed his identity. It showed his profession. But he wasn't raised a shepherd, was Moses. 
He was raised in the palaces and halls of Egypt. He had the best education of the world at that time. The most math that was known at that time was done in Egypt. Agriculture, buildings, economics, they had it all. He knew all of it. He was educated by the best mind. He had the Harvard and Tufts University education. And he was a shepherd. Nothing wrong with that, but that's not what he was trained to do. And what's more interesting is the Egyptians specifically, as that time in that race, they loathed the shepherds because they saw them as the lowest level. You, there's no skill required. You're just a warm body pushing a dumb animal with a, piece of, with a stick. <laughs> so when, when Moses said, when God said, what's in your hand? And he looks at it and he goes, a rod? I wonder how he said it. Was he like, a staff? Or was he like, oh, a staff? Maybe it was a representation of Moses' perceived failures. Maybe he thought, I know I'm better than this. Maybe I shouldn't have been doing this. Maybe he felt shame. Are there things, and, or maybe he wasn't using it for what God wanted it to be used for, right? Are there things in your hand that maybe you feel shame about? Are there things that God wants to use? Go with me to verse 3, if you could pop that verse back up. This is crazy. And he said, this is God. Cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground. Listen, sometimes, this is the only thing he had. This is, his staff is what identified him. This is what God gave him to use. He says, okay, so now I know what it is. It's a staff. It's a rod. Use it for sheep. I want you to throw it to the ground. What he's saying is, give it to me. Throw it down. The thing I have you, the gift that is given your hand, he's saying, Lord, you can have it all. Man, that was perfect. I have these things. Throw it to the ground. Because on the ground, it means nothing. On the ground is where they washed and, you know, there wasn't very sanitary in those days. And things that come out, bodily functions, grossness, there was no irrigation. Stuff was on the ground. That's where the sheep were at. He's like, this thing that you're going to touch, throw it in the ground. Throw it in the dirt. Make it unclean. And God's saying to us today, well, those things that we're holding on to, that maybe we have shame about, and God wants to use it. But first he's saying, throw it on the ground. Get rid of it. Look at somebody and say, throw it on the ground. We do this silly thing with my boys where, uh, so we've been playing basketball, and Ezra, he's really passionate about his basketball. And he's had, the last couple games are done now, but he had a couple games where he experienced bad calls in basketball. And I'm like, hey, buddy, you're going to get bad calls sometimes. He's like, but I did, I did what you said. I was up. I didn't foul him. I had my hands straight up. I was like, I know. It just Sometimes you're just not going to get good calls. And then he was getting in his head. And he was getting all frustrated and worked up. And he couldn't. And then he was like, you know, he'd get real frustrated. Like, he almost he was crying the one time. But he just he couldn't get his composure right. I was like, you got to have a short memory. So you got to get it. You just take it out of your head and just throw it on the ground. And so physically, we started doing that. And then it happened in a game. He got another bad call that week. And he looked over at me because I, I was the coach, and so I'm out there on the court. He looked at me, and I said, throw it. He went like this, and he threw it. And then he went and kept on his game. I was like, oh, proud dad moment. That was cool. <laughs> but, but God said, <laughs> I'm missing the point. But God saying is that we need to physically sometimes just take it out of our head. So do it with me. Think of that thing. Think of that thing that's been keeping us back. Maybe it's a gift God gave you that you're not giving to him. Take it, think about it. Take a second, think about it. Grab it in your hand physically. I want you to grab it in your hand like this. I won't even look at you. And just throw it down. Throw it. Say, Lord, I give it to you. Lord, you can, you can have that. The next verse, under verse 4, he's, the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take this now snake by the tail. Think about that for two seconds. That is not a smart thing to do. I'm not a fan of snakes. I've killed probably about four of them in my life. I try to avoid them at all opportunities. But have you ever seen, like, those nature shows, and they go, and some crazy guy with a hat, and he rattles, and he grabs the snake? You ever see him grabbing it by the, by, by the tail? No. Oh, what happens if you grab it by the tail? That's dangerous. It's going to come get you, right? God just asked him. Threw away his stick, now just become a, a serpent. You know, that's not a normal thing. And then he says, hey, uh, now I want you to do something more. What he was saying was, trust me. 
do something dangerous and let me show you how I can work on your behalf. Throw it to the ground, grab it from the tail, and immediately it came back to the staff on what it was the purpose it, God had created that staff to be. He's saying, trust me. And he uses what we already have. All right, I'm going to take a drink break. Think about that. We're going to go to sec- Second Kings 4. Yes. <laughs> Turn to your Bible. Second Kings 4. sake of this, I am again going to go and use, because I just, it's easier for me. This is, we've heard this before, but this is something interesting that popped out, right? Elisha and the widow's oil. We've heard this before, right? Remember the story? So we're going to read through this. I want to point out just a couple things real briefly. And a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, your servant, my husband is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, what am I going to do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in, the jar, nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you've come in, you shall shut the doors behind you. And your sons, then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went out and shut the door and her sons, and they did brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out. And now it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said to her sons, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there isn't any more. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God and said, go, sell the oil and pay your debt, and you and your sons shall live on the rest. All right. Two things I want to point out here. One thing that pointed out to me that I didn't really think about before, but this is definitely like a thing that Pat would have told me, I'm thinking. (laughs) Just a deep kind of thing. The woman, back to verse 1, 2 Kings verse 4, 1. He says, a certain woman of of the wives of the sons of the prophet cried out to Elisha. When they say that, what they're, they're not actually saying they were like a physical, biological son of the prophets of those days. The sons of the prophets, for you, if a little lesson that aren't as familiar, these were the disciples of like Elijah and Elisha, Right? They went around with them. These were spiritual leaders of the towns in that day. They, they were disciples. They walked around. They were with them. And so she goes to Elisha. So, like, and she says, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that you're servant for the Lord. She was saying, hey, by the way, uh, your servant, she's showing the relationship. This isn't my thing. This is, this is you and him. He served. You know my husband was a godly man and served you. And she's calling out, this is what was being the leader this is what was owed to me. And he's kind of saying, well, I, if I did this for her, I got this for everybody. You know, what was his thinking? Um, but I just thought that was interesting. It was the wife, he was the son of the wives. He wasn't just some random person in the town. This was one of his leadership team. This was his crew. And down on verse two, and he says, well, what shall I do for you? And then he thought, tell me, what do you have? What is it that you have? Because that's God speaking to him. What can God use? What do you have that God can use? And she says, I got nothing but a jar of oil. And in verse 3, he says, go, borrow. That's it. All I have is a jar of oil. That's not much. All I have is, he goes, go borrow more vessels. Go, action, now. All I have is this. What's in your hand? All I have was a staff. All I have is a jar of oil. All I have is this thing that God gave me that I'm not using right now. Go, use it. The next one, I'm not, I didn't have the verse on this, but for the sake of time, First Samuel 17, you know, is about when David slew the giant. What did he have? Five stones. Wasn't much, but he used it. He was good with a sling, but he wasn't a warrior. We know the story. He doesn't put on the armor. He wasn't trained in warrior battles. Sure, he practiced all the time, likely, and killed the lion and the bear and all these things. He takes the giant. He used what he had. And yet his legacy, not trained as a warrior, right? His legacy was known as a great warrior. That wasn't his profession. His profession was a shepherd. <laughs> That's all he was trained. He wasn't trained in the acts of fighting and warrior and all the stuff that Saul had. And yet he was known as the song, Saul's killed his thousands and he's killed his tens thousands. That was what he was known for. God used them for a different purpose than what he thought. Matthew 14, 15 through 18. I'm going to grab it again here. And 
this is the feeding, the famous part about feeding the 5,000. In verse 15, and when it came evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place and the hour is late. Send the multitudes away that they may go to the villages and buy food themselves. But Jesus said to them, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to them, we only have, uh, we, only, uh, we have here only five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them to me. Bring them to me. He says, what do you have? All we have is a couple fish. He said, bring it. That's what I can use. All I have is a pot. Bring it. That's what I can use. All I have is a car. All I have is this. All I have is this one little thing. And Jesus says, yep, that's it. That'll do. I made the heavens and the earth with my voice. I made you with a little bit of dirt. You have something already created? I can use that. Bring that to me. So think about this, guys. This is, I'm speaking to myself because God's spoken to me on these things, but he asked me to share it today. And so he's saying, what are the things that we have that we're not using? God's saying, bring it to me. Let me use it. Cast it down. Trust me that well, you're going to pick it back up, but with you. And listen, there's some huge promise that's coming at the end of this that I haven't, I haven't opened yet at the end in Exodus about God using that staff, about what happens when we trust him, pick it back up, and he repurposes it for him. Instead of focusing on what we don't have, we must focus on what he's already provided us to use. The things we often ignore, maybe we're ungrateful for. I've got little kids, so we deal with that a lot, don't we, Megan? <laughs> ah, the whining and stuff. Oh, drives me nuts. You have it better than when I was your age. You are blessed. Stop it. Right? I know. I know he's there. I had a, I had a good childhood, but I've, God has blessed me, and I try to bless my kids, and I'm trying not to make them spoiled. But on a serious note, what are the things that maybe we're ungrateful for that God has given us? What are the relationships that he's given us that we've taken for granted that won't be there forever? Life is fleeting. What do you have in your hands that God can use? The Bible's full of examples of good servants providing more value to their masters, to the owners, bringing it back full circle. How can we be an asset? Probably the most uh, famous passage of scriptures on this is in Matthew 25, verse 14. This is the parable of the talents. Wouldn't you know what? Pastor Matt said something right at the end today about the parable of the talents, about using those things. I'll read through this quickly. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he left, he went on a journey. Then he who had the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. Sounds like an asset to me. And likewise, he who had received two came two more also. But he who had received just the one went and dug a hole, the gift he was given, and he hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Was that as far as I went? Oh, no. And so he had, who had received the five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five, and look, I've gained five more besides them. And his Lord said, well done, you good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And he also, who had received the two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, here's two more besides them. And then he who had received the one came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. I'm just going to give it back to you. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown, and I gather where I have not scattered. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at the coming I would have received back mine own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to those who have the him who had the ten talents. For to everyone who has more will be given. He who will have abundant, uh, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, 
even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That sounds heavy, just for like, oh, God gave it to me. I didn't lose it. I still got it. And God's saying, you're a liability. You took what I gave you and did nothing with it. I'm calling you to spiritual maturity. I'm calling you to go out from just, I trusted you with it. Now you need to go take that step forward and create more of you. Has God given you a gift of evangelism? Has he given him a gift of tongues? Has he given you a gift of, what are the things God has given you? Are you good in administration? Are you good with finances? Are you a good leader? Are you a good coordinator? Are you good with children? It's one thing to just do your gift, but can you create more of you? Can you, rep- can you repeat the process, right? When we all start coming to spiritual maturity, guys, that's how this church is going to grow. That's how we grow personally. That's how in three years from now, we don't have the same prayer to God at nighttime. God, I wish you would just, could you help me with? That's the hard one, guys. We're not coming to spiritual maturity. He's like, I need you a different prayer. Your prayer needs to be, God, how can I? Not what I'm not. How can I for you? See, I I love creative problem solving. It's like a weird niche thing of mine. I love shaking things up with, like, at work and other things. Like, oh, we can't, we can't. I love that because I go, no, no, no. How you phrase it is, how can we get to, not why can't we. It's how can we get there. It might not be easy, but there's a path if you just phrase it differently in your head. Guys, we need to change our thinking. How can God use me in X, Y, Z? Oh, I'm not really good. Pray that prayer. There's a verse about that here in just a second. All right, we've got to move on. So here's the house. Be faithful. We're being faithful in our jobs. Are we an asset our, at work? Are we an asset in our relationships? That's outside the church. Are you an asset? Are you reliable? Does your boss, maybe you are the boss, know that you are not going to be poured into, they're going to invest in you, send you for training, do all these things, and you just, hey, I did the bare minimum. I did what I was supposed to do. I punched out. I'm done. Or can you be relied on to stand apart? Because we're not supposed to look like everybody else. That's how you look like somebody else in, in, in your job in the workplace. That's how you minister to people and say, listen, I'm going to be an asset. So-and-so, listen, they got out. I'm done at 4, I'm out the door at 3.58, you know. I'm not saying stay longer because I'm more about quality than time, right, quantity. But can you be relied upon? Are you set apart and different? Does your work ethic look differently than someone else who's not a believer than yours? That's how you minister. Because like, you work differently. I know we've talked about this a lot here. Be faithful in all you do. Be reliable, trustworthy. Think of ways that we can be faithful. When we're faithful, we can be trusted with more responsibilities and opportunities to serve. Matthew 25, 21. You can pop that up. Matthew 25, 21. I'll take a drink. We just said this one. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. God rewards faithfulness. Are you faithful in this church? God will reward it. Are you faithful in your job? God will reward it. If you are not faithful, you will be, how does that passage end? Set out in the darkness of the weeping and gnashing of teeth. And you were even given something. Moving on. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2. Let a man so consider as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Let a man can so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards. In the, oh, I already said that. First, is that both of them? Yeah, all right, cool. Thanks, Esther. I'm sorry. Stewards must be found faithful. God rewards faithfulness, and he's requiring it of us. And the last one on faithfulness is Proverbs 28.20. A faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. Faithful people will be blessed, and it's a promise. It's a promise. We must use our gifts. Another way to be an asset is to use our gifts and talents to serve others. God has given each of us unique abilities that we can use to help others and advance his kingdom. We should not be like the parable of the talents and bury it. 
but invest them in ways that bring glory to God and benefit others. You see what I'm saying? I'm not just saying like, hey, go jump on the stock market and call up Jared to do some financial whatevers, right? Like, I'm saying like your spiritual gifts here, guys. How do we do that? 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11. 1 Peter 4. As each one of you have received a gift, a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards in the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with ability, which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. We're to use our gifts to serve others. Romans 12, 4 through 8. For as we may, for, uh, let me start over. for as we have many members in one body, but all members do not have the same function. Guys, all of us, we're all needed. We don't have the same function. So we, being many, are one in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that's given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Our ministry, let us use it in our ministering. Who, he who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. We all have different gifts to use to serve. And in Ephesians, last bit on the gifts, Ephesians 4, 11 through uh, 13. And he himself gave some to the apostles and prophets and evangelists, some pastors, teachers, for the equipping of the saints to work in the ministry. We've heard this before. There was a whole thing on this <clears throat> not too long ago, right? For the edifying of the body of Christ, not for ourselves, not for our own glory, for Christ. Till we uh, all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the, stat of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Until we all reach unity in faith, and knowledge of the Son of Christ, and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. It's great that we, hey, we accept Jesus, we know he's God, checkbox. Now what? There's something more required in us. We have to come to that fullness of maturity. Are you going to be an asset, or will you be a liability? I cut down to this, stepped up mentioned this already, instead of being a, a liability by complaining, right? A liability causes problems. It's issues. You have to put more money into it, liabilities often do. It's, it drags on. We need to be more like this problem solver. Instead of saying things like, I don't like this. I wish we did that. I don't like that the church does this. I wish the church would do this more. Sounds like an opportunity for you to be found to be an asset in this house. We must change our liability thinking. Someone who is an asset must train themselves to think differently. A liability thinks of their abilities and gifts as what they can use to get for them. A kingdom asset thinker says, how can I use this for God's kingdom? How can I produce more value? This is how we achieve spiritual maturity, guys. And then teaching that to somebody else. We should be looking for ways to address challenges and find those solutions to benefit everyone. When we take the initiative to maybe solve a problem, we're demonstrating leadership and we earn respect. Philippians 2, verse about this, Philippians 2, 14 through 15. Do all things without complaining and disputing. Don't be a liability. That you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Whew. Do everything without complaining. You say, I don't know how to be an asset. James 1, verse 5. I like the book of James. It's one of my favorites. If any of you lack wisdom, here's guys, I don't know how to do it. God said, that's fine. I'm not asking you to know. I'm asking you to trust. I'm asking you to cast down. And if you don't know, let him ask of God, if you lack wisdom, who gives all things liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. If you don't know, God said, that's fine. I do. You don't need to know. Ask me. I got it. When we use what God has already given us to be an asset instead of a liability, we come into that full covenant and walk in the purpose he has for us. So I ask, what has he given to you? Think about it. What aren't you using? And maybe what won't you allow him to use?
I want to go back to Exodus. You don't have to put this one verse up just yet. Back on that first part. Now put it back up. Go to Exodus 4, uh, 2. Exodus 4, 2. Thank you, Esther. I appreciate that. And the Lord said to him, what's in your hand? It's just a rod, right? It says, throw it down. Reach out your hand and the rod. And it became in his hand. He knew to use it. But this is what really hit me this when I was doing some reading on this. Exodus 4.20. Exodus 4.20. And then Moses took his wife and his sons. This is later in the chapter, guys. After this whole thing with the snake happened. And he sent them on a donkey. And he returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hands. Hold on. It didn't say that before. There was a word missing there. It just said it was a rod. But what happened was he took what was in his hand, right? He trusted God, used it for his purposes, and now he trusted him, picked it up, and now that rod that was already in his hands can be used for what God wanted to be, and now it's been called and set apart and has purpose, and now it's called not the rod, it's the rod of God in his hands. What I want to encourage you all as our last couple of thoughts here wrapping up is God saying, what is it that I already gave to you that you can use to be an asset? That staff was used to be an asset. There's a whole long thing when God said, use, you know, pour it out, and they turned the, the, the river into blood, and all the, the, the plagues that happened in, in Egypt was because God said, didn't say, put your hand over and do this. He said, use this object that I gave you. Trust me with this, this stick. Pour it out and watch me move. Because now it's of God. It's not just of stick, of Moses, <laughs> right? It's of God. It has purpose. It bloomed. I mean, there's a part where they talk about they put the stick in and they left it and they closed the door and they came back and it bloomed at flowers. It was producing, right? Are we assets that can produce? Being an asset instead of a choice or instead of a liability, it's a choice. Everything's a choice. I can choose to do something. I choose to eat right. I can choose to whatever. It's a choice. No one makes you do any of this. God's not going to make you do it, but he sure, sure would like you to. He sure would like you to. Colossians 3, 17. A couple verses, so I'm just wrapping this up. Whatever you do in the word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the God of the Father through him. Everything that you do, guys, the bottom line there, do it in the name of Jesus. Matthew 5, 16. We're commanded. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Be an asset on the job. Be an asset in your workplace. Be set aside that you would so shine before men that your good works wouldn't glorify you, that they would see God in what you're doing, in your attitude at work, in your producing of assets, right? Shine before others. 1 Corinthians 10.31 1 Corinthians 10, whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do to the glory of God. By being faithful and using our gifts and being a problem solver, a resource, that's how we make a positive impact, right, on the world around us, on our church, on our family, with our relationships. I ask for everyone today, let us commit to being assets to God. Let's commit to being assets to each other, to our church, to our community, so that we can bring glory to his name. Let's use what he's already given us. Allow him to transform it from just a staff, right? A thing in our hand. Those things God has already given to us that we're holding on to, to let go, to make a choice, to trust him, and make it from a, just a staff or just a rod to the staff of God. Let's make a choice to think with an asset mindset that we would increase value to ourselves, but we'd increase value to others, to so increase value to our church. So let's just stand and let me just pray that real quickly and we'll pass it, pass it over to Pastor Matt. I thank you for your attention. I thank you for bearing with me. 
I thank you for maybe taking one on the nose when I said something that you didn't want to hear because I didn't want to hear some of this too. But when it comes to spiritual growth, growth is hard, right? It costs us something. It requires something of us. We must do something. But how many times have you seen it over and over again? You do a little bit. You just take that little half step to God. He's like, I can use that, right? All I have is fish. Bring it to me. That'll work. All I got's a pot. Go. That, that'll do. All I have is this thing. So, Lord, I ask that you would point out to us even now in our heads, in our minds, what are those assets, what are those things, those gifts you've given us that you said, I want you to use that for me. Lord, help us to walk in those fullness, Jesus. Help us to be assets in our job, in our life, to our family, to this church. Lord Jesus, help us to be assets. Let your spirit go before us. Let it be with us. Let us carry the presence of you this week, this afternoon, to our family, to our places, to our, la- our, our areas of influence, Jesus, that it would be used for your purposes and your glory, that your hand would go before us, Lord, that your hand would be on this church, that your hand would be on this people, Lord, that the spirit that we felt today would not leave us, Lord, that it would only grow in Jesus' name. Thank you for this people. Thank you for your, your spirit and being with us today. Bless us as we go in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Brent. Amen. We just want to...